Hi, I'm Taryn, and welcome to the YouTube channel for Most Fashionable Crime, a fashion-related true crime podcast. In this episode, I'm talking about the second and third episode. The second episode is about the House of Chanel, and the third episode is about the House of Hugo Boss. In this video, I'm talking about how both of the founders of those brands were involved with the Nazis and how that involvement plays a role today. You might be wondering why Chanel or Hugo Boss didn't try to rebrand and change the name, but there are a few reasons, there's probably many reasons why these brands didn't do that. One is expensive to rebrand. You would have to change your packaging, your marketing, you have to get your trademarks redone. You would have to do a lot to change the name of these brands. Brands have done it in the past, but when it comes to fashion, you pretty much stick to what you know. And also these brands have been known for years, especially at that point where they did get involved with the Nazis. It would take a while for people to regroup and relearn. I would say another reason is that the names of these brands, the names of the people are relatively cool. I feel like both of their names kind of demonstrate what the feel and look of those brands are. Like for instance, Coco Chanel sounds very feminine. It sounds very luxurious. It sounds super nice. Like it just has a nice sound to it. And then Hugo Boss sounds very masculine. Like if you hear the name and think, oh, I wonder what they sell, you probably think of nice suits. So I think it's like their names kind of do their job. And then also going into my next step, you have Goodwill, which is something I learned in accounting. I took accounting. I took two accounting classes and I'm probably getting this wrong. So if anyone wants to correct me or help explain in the comments, just let me know and I'll put in notes in the description box. But, and I might be getting the wrong term, but there's this thing called Goodwill. So for instance, Chanel is a prestige brand, it's a luxury brand. So if someone had the option to buy Chanel, they will obviously get what it's worth, like the tangible, but, but then you have like the intangible. So like, how much is that name worth? Like how much is the Chanel name worth? Like if I were to take the Chanel name and put on like, I'm gonna start manufacturing Chanel cameras. That name, the Chanel name is worth a lot because you know, it's associated with being luxurious. It's associated with being nice quality, that type of thing. So I believe that's called Goodwill. So since that name is already, if you hear the name Chanel, you probably think expensive, nice. That's part of the Goodwill in my understanding. So those are about three reasons for why these brands probably didn't rebrand. With that, you have years of these brands being established as household brands, like well-known brands that people seek out and go after, or brands that people desire to be able to obtain. So if you haven't listened to the two episodes, please go and do that before watching this video. We have some differences between the two brands. So for instance, Coco Chanel the person is still pretty relevant to this day and still greatly associated with the Chanel brand despite her death in 1970s and the 1970s. So for instance, we see wall art, we see Chanel quotes all the time. We see people naming their dogs and children Coco and or Chanel. Like we see a lot of that association with you know, Chanel the person as well as the Chanel the brand. And they're still super connected. Like I got an alert on my phone today about some sort of Coco Chanel perfume or something. You'll see in like their copy, like they'll still use Coco Chanel versus just Chanel. But the Chanel like fashion wise that we know today that we think of when we see like those vintage runway looks, that is a lot to do with Karl Lagerfeld. So a lot of people's association, if it comes to the actual fashion of it, they're probably thinking of Karl Lagerfeld. Then you have Hugo Boss. And when it comes to Hugo Boss, the person behind it is really just the name. They, you know, Hugo Boss died in 1948 and then they rebranded. So the Hugo Boss that was alive and well when Hugo Boss was alive and well is not the Hugo Boss or Boss that we know today. So for instance, like if you go to search Hugo Boss, you'll find one picture. You probably won't find any quotes. There's not a lot of information about him as there is about Chanel. There's like books about Chanel, plenty of articles, photographs, you name it. She was hobnobbing with the likes of royalty, high society, that kind of thing. Hugo Boss, there really is not that much information about his personal life or whatever he did outside of his business. And I think, as I mentioned in the podcast, I think that's intentional. Another difference between Coco Chanel and Hugo Boss is that Chanel didn't necessarily support the Nazis through 
the business, there was something I read about her giving away like free perfume to like Nazi soldiers to give to their girlfriends and wives back home. But other than that, I haven't seen anything where like the actual Chanel business supported the Nazis. I'm sure like maybe the money did somehow, like if she gave to the cause or something, but the Chanel, the brand, I don't think actually supported the Nazis. Whereas Hugo Boss definitely supported the Nazis with his brand. He didn't design for them, but he produced and manufactured clothing for them and was a supporter of the Nazis and was a part of the Nazi party. And then also like with his brand, he had some type of copy, like marketing, something about being a supporter of the, Na of the National Socialist Party, the Nazi party since 1924. I couldn't find anything where, oh, like on behalf of whatever Coco Chanel did and her association with um, the Nazi party, we apologize on that. On the other hand, Hugo Boss, they have on the history page of their website, they mentioned that they made a contribution to the international fund set up to compensate former forced laborers. It's not necessarily an apology. It's more so, okay, we paid some money to some people to kind of, you know, clear our conscience. And um, we have like this page kind of documenting what the actual history of it, because what I noticed, if you go to the history of their website, they did not mention anything prior to 1946 or 1950, which doesn't make sense to me because if you're gonna talk about the history of your company, you have to talk about the entire history of your company. They don't even mention that, oh, like this was founded in 1924. Like when it comes to this, they just talk about um, when they started making men's suits, which I could see in the sense that they did rework, they did rebrand um, following the death of Hugo Boss, but if you're going to talk about the beginnings of your company, you need to talk about the beginning of your company, in my opinion. I can see two sides when it comes to whether or not to support or not support these two brands due to their involvement with Nazis. So on the side of support, I could see, okay, someone saying, okay, um, well, these two people are not associated with this brand at all. They're dead. Their families aren't involved, at least not to my knowledge. Um, I can see them saying, you know, like they're completely different brands. Like I support the designers and people behind it of today. And it's really just a name or they're just a figurehead of the brand. So I can see people supporting it because of that. We're on the other side. Like, obviously I can see people not wanting to support these brands because of their history and past due to their involvement with Nazis. So I can see what the two sides of this could potentially be. So as of today, I think Hugo Boss kind of got some pressure to make, you know, like a statement and acknowledge the history of their brand versus I think Chanel just, the Chanel brand is just like, okay, like the lady is dead. She has no association with us. And I could be wrong and just like missing somewhere where maybe they apologized or did something, or I'm thinking they might even do something like quietly, like maybe they haven't made like a public statement or anything, and I could be wrong. But I think that's kind of the two stances that they take. And it's interesting like just doing these episodes and just learning the different brands that did have associations with the Nazis. Like Kodak, Bayer, Volkswagen, all had associations and ties with the Nazis or were something that were developed as a result of the Nazi party. I think when you look at the history of a lot of things, it can be very tricky. Like for instance, if you're in America, a lot of the businesses and companies today have roots that tie back to slavery or were built due to slavery or the families have money due to slavery and other things. Personally, I think it's best to not ignore the past of your company. I feel like it's good to acknowledge the past and history of your company. I don't think it's good to just brush it aside and just be like, oh, you know, well, that happened. I think it's good to you know give opportunities give money give something to people you know in order to try to you can't absolve it you can't erase what happened but to just try to show that you acknowledge what happened and we're going to actively do something to kind of convey like this is the history of your company like if you're i feel like if you're going to keep the names of these brands you have to acknowledge all that embodied the people behind those brands. I think it's an interesting conversation to have and I would love to hear your thoughts. Let me know in the comments. 
Uh, be sure to listen and download the episodes of the podcast. Make sure that you subscribe to this channel. And thank you for listening and watching.